Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Today, we have the great honor and privilege of having Dr. Rao with us. Dr. Madhuri Rao is Assistant Professor with the Division of General Thoracic and Forget Surgery at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Rao was born and raised in Bangalore, India, and where she also completed her medical school. She did her basic surgical training with the United Kingdom National Health Service, where she obtained her MRCS, or membership of the Royal College of Surgeons, and moved to the US in 2008 and completed her general surgery residency from SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, New York, and as well as her cardiothoracic surgery fellowship at Mount Sinai. Dr. Rao's clinical practice includes the breadth of general thoracic surgery with, a, with an interest in minimally invasive and innovative approaches, including the use of newer techniques such as robotic surgery and alternate thoracoscopic approaches. In addition to her clinical responsibilities, Dr. Rao dedicates her time to work on disparities in cancer care. She's also very involved in the Women in Surgery Interest Groups and serves as the faculty advisor for the AWS chapter at the University of Minnesota Medical School. She's also active in the DEI Council of the Department of Surgery. Dr. Rao, thank you so much for your time and your willingness to be here with us. Thank you so much for having me. So to introduce myself and my team, my name is Priyanka Sensel, and with me, with me I have Anish Gukulam. We're part of the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, or ALSI for short. And we would like to take a few minutes to share about our organization and introduce lung cancer and lung cancer screening. ALSI is a 501c3 nonprofit that works to raise awareness for lung cancer and lung cancer screening. We're a team of about 200 students and doctors located across the United States. And we do the work that we do because lung cancer is the deadliest cancer in the world, causing more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon cancers combined. Lung cancer causes about 380 deaths per day in the U.S. alone. Lung cancer is very fatal because currently many patients are being diagnosed at a late stage when the cancer has grown and spread to other parts of the body. Lung cancer screening is an effective imaging technique that can be used to screen for lung cancer and has been shown to catch lung cancers early. However, less than 6% of people at high risk for lung cancer are currently getting screened. And the screening rate for lung cancer is much lower than the screening rates for breast, cervical, and colon cancers, which are about 70%. We believe that educating people about lung cancer and lung cancer screening is one of the most important and effective ways to increase the lung cancer screening rate for populations that would benefit from lung cancer screening. So far, we've given over 250 presentations on lung cancer and lung cancer screening to universities, hospitals, medical schools, and organizations around the US, as well as India, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico, reaching over 10,000 people. And over the last year, we've worked with over 340 mayors from every single US state to issue proclamations recognizing November as National Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And we've also had the opportunity to work with several leaders at the state level, including multiple mayors, Arizona State Senator Leela Alston, who's a lung cancer survivor, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf and Lieutenant Governor of Colorado Diane Primavera to issue public service announcements emphasizing the importance of lung cancer screening. In addition to our education, outreach, and advocacy efforts, we recently started this podcast series to share the personal side of lung cancer and provide a platform for lung cancer survivors and advocates to share their stories. Elsie also worked with U.S. Congress members and senators to draft and advocate for the first ever House and Senate resolutions recognizing the importance of the early detection of lung cancer through screening. And in December 2022, the U.S. Senate passed a bipartisan resolution for the third year in a row, recognizing November 2022 as National Lung Cancer Awareness Month and expressing support for the early detection and treatment of lung cancer. Senate Resolution 863 expands on previous resolutions by emphasizing the need to increase awareness of screening among veterans, women, and racial minorities. Alcee also actively worked with Representative Brennan Boyle and Senator Tina Smith to draft and advocate for Catherine's Law for Lung Cancer Early Detection and Survival Act of 2021. Lastly, we want to end by talking a little bit about lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening is done using a low-dose computed tomography scan. This scan uses low radiation doses, is pain-free, and takes less than five minutes to complete. The United States Permanent Services Task Force, also known as the USPSTF, sets guidelines for who should be screened for lung cancer. And right now, they recommend that people between the ages of 50 and 80 who have a 20-pack year smoking history or more, and who are currently smoking or have quit within the past 15 years, get annual low-dose CT scans. One pack year is defined as smoking on average one pack a day for one year, and therefore 20 pack years can be met by smoking one pack a day for 20 years or smoking two packs a day for 10 years, for example. So if you know anyone who might be eligible for lung cancer screening based on the criteria just discussed, please encourage them to take our lung cancer screening eligibility survey so that they can learn whether they are eligible and can have the opportunity to connect with their team at ALSI to guide them through the screening process. And finally, we want to highlight that there are other risk factors for lung cancer in addition to smoking, such as exposure to asbestos, a family history of lung cancer, COPD, and previous radiation therapy to the lungs. 
We believe that it is important to recognize these additional risk factors because a large number of people in the United States who have never smoked still get lung cancer. So thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to that quick introduction to lung cancer screening. And without further ado, we can jump right into the podcast. We have a few questions prepared for Dr. Rao, but we will also have a Q&A session at the end where um, you, get, you all can answer any, ask any questions um, to Dr. Rao directly. So um, our first question for you, Dr. Rao, is um, as a thoracic surgeon, could you describe what a day in your life looks like? Yeah, um, I'd say one word is full. Um, Days are busy, but they're fulfilling. Um, so, you know, and it's not something that you realize on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, my day, uh, well, my week consists of um, uh, anywhere from five to seven working days, depending on if I'm call, on call or not. Uh, but during the week, uh, Monday to Friday, I operate at least three days a week. Uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays are my operating days. Sometimes I operate on Tuesdays and otherwise Thursday is my clinic day. So it's a, it's a good mix of being in different places. My day usually starts around 6.45 or so. Um, I mean, my day in the hospital starts around 6.45 or so. Most times, you know, just signing in the patient and getting the patient ready for the first uh, surgery of the day, which is usually 7.30. And then beyond that... Um, so most times I know when my day starts, but never really when it ends. Um, and that doesn't mean it ends late always, you know, it depends on the case and how things are going and, you know, whether I'm on call or not. But that's an average day is probably seven, seven to five. Um, and then all other things come into play. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Um, can you talk about um, why you chose thoracic surgery? Yeah, um, it's just one of those things that, you know, sometimes you just know what, what you like, and that's, you know, you're, it's hard to like anything else after that. Uh, so for me, it was the same sort of story with um, uh, choosing surgery and so choosing thoracic surgery. So my first day on the surgical rotation during med school, I was just so drawn to it. And it was, it was just natural. I didn't have to think about it. And it just, um, it was just definitely something I wanted to pursue. And I did with appropriate encouragement and, uh, you know, mentorship and everything. And then once I was done with surgery, um, well, I thought I was going to do pediatric surgery or fetal surgery. And, you know, when I initially applied to surgical residencies, um, but my first thoracic case on the surgery residency again was that same sort of feeling it was like ah oh, this is it I know I like this um so there's that uh you know just knowing that that's what you want to do but also just thinking about it more rationally it's uh I think I really like the breadth of um you know of the specialty it's not it's not it's not limited it's you know it's something that um, you know, I see, I see older people, I see younger people, I see cancer, and I see patients with other issues other than cancer. Um, as a general thoracic surgeon, I'm involved with, um, uh, you know, taking care of parts of the body that's above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm, and in the neck as well sometimes. So it's, it's a really broad scope. And I think I really enjoy that. I enjoy the pathology. I enjoy the anatomy of the lung. If I had to pick one thing, that's my favorite uh, in terms of the technical aspects. So there's, that's the other aspect to it. And then just the the people that you know I interact with, with whether it's cancers, not cancers, it's it's always a, a worthwhile experience. And it's cancer care is always something that can be you know stressful but also rewarding at the same time. Wonderful. And could you talk about um, some of the patients that you care for and treat? What are the what are the types of patients that you usually um, see? Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, sort of going on from the last question as well. These are these are all the conditions that you know um, I treat as part of being a general thoracic surgeon. So the lung, the trachea, esophagus, mediastinum, chest wall, diaphragm, foregut. Um, and basically, it's you know anything above or below the diaphragm is is still fair well, fair game for for us. Uh, but again, in terms of what 
the types of uh, patients, I think it depends on what we're looking at, you know, is it the pathology or the patient itself? So in terms of pathology, of course, you know, we just talked about all the different types of diseases and cancers and non-cancers. Uh, but in my current practice, in terms of types of patients, well, young and old, you know, sometimes as young as, you know, even um, 18 year olds that are just past the, the pediatric uh, phase, you know, sometimes things like um, uh, hyperhidrosis, excessive sweating, you know, that's that's something that's seen in the younger people more commonly, as opposed to sometimes uh, large hiatal hernias that are incarcerated or, you know, reducible. That's something that we see in much older people like the 80s. So there's a full age range of people that we see. Uh, also, in terms of, you know, there's a bi wide variety in terms of, you know, levels of education, understanding, rural versus urban background. I think one of the big things for me being in a place like the University of Minnesota, where we have a large catchment area of about five states, um, we see all the, all the you know, people with all different backgrounds, you know, people that are farmers from the Dakotas coming in that basically, you know, um, really um, may not be exposed to a lot of, um, you know, information or medical information and where you have to start from scratch. Um, and then there are the very well-educated people from within the cities who are, you know, doctors or medical professionals where, you know, you have to be on a totally different level in terms of um, explaining things to them. So, yeah, it's a wide range. What are some of the common surgical techniques and procedures that you use? So in terms of uh, techniques, it's um, it's basically what the disease and the patient demands. And so that could range from being, you know, a traditional open surgery with a big incision to get to where we need to and do what we need to, to, you know, minimally invasive surgery, uh, namely thoracoscopic, laparoscopic, or uh, more recently robotic surgery. Also endoscopic techniques, there are some things that we do uh, with endoscopy, like stents or, you know, um, uh, repairs or perforations, things like that. So uh, endoscopic techniques. Um, so this is, it's all, you know, it's a, a mix of things. But I would say at this point, majority of my practice is minimally invasive or robotic surgery. So that probably is like, I'd say 70% of the practice, another 15% or so, 10% or so with open and the rest of it is probably a little bit of everything else. And for our audience here, could you um, explain what minimally invasive surgery is? Yeah, so minimally invasive surgery, you know, as the name goes, is anything that's less invasive to the patient and the body. And um, that is comparing it to the maximally invasive, which was the traditional make an open cut where you know everything's widely exposed and you you're able to get your hands in there to do whatever you need to do so whether it's in the abdomen or the chest uh you know making making an incision which will let you get your hands in there to do what you need to do so minimally invasive um uh, is uh surgery that's done through uh smaller incisions uh which has a which has less of an impact on the patient's body and physiology and uh, basically is done with um, assistance of a camera be it you know thoracoscopic laparoscopic surgery or um, uh, or with the robot so it's all still within the realm of minimally invasive uh, so why uh, and why why minimally invasive or why is it called minimally invasive of course one is just you know, just from having smaller incisions, of course, but also, like we said, it's a lesser impact on the body um, and better for the body's physiology. And I, mean, I can go into a little bit more about that if we have time, but that's the that's the basic stuff. And wonderful. And, and what are um, some cases in which patients wouldn't be candidates for minimally invasive surgery? Yeah, that's a good question. It's um that's that ten percent that you know ten to fifteen percent that we were talking about. Um, uh, but it could be it could be a few reasons. It could be patient related factors. It could be you know safety reasons. It could be um you know uh, surgeon related factors. But it's important to see if it is. It's not. It's not something 
to employ just because you can make a small incision. It has to be that will the surgery that you're doing be appropriate and adequate and oncologically or you know technically sound for what's required to be done. So some of the things that would exclude a patient would be say a really large tumor. Um, you know what's the point of making you know doing everything with small one centimeter incisions and then at the end you have to open it up to 10 centimeters to get a 20 centimeter tumor out. So size of you know the tumor or the lesion that we're taking out or sometimes um, uh, you know just just the location of it so if it's very close to some major blood vessels or you know uh, areas that need to be controlled in a um, in a more planned way um, so if we're operating say very close to the heart or the, the tumor that's really stuck to some of the central blood vessels then you don't want to be you know stuck in there with small incisions small instruments that you can't immediately get to and control something if there's an issue so those would be some factors. The other thing, of course, it's a it's a resource. It's uh, there are places, and especially talking about, like, say, robotic surgery and stuff. Not not every time can you get a robot easily available at, at the time that you want to do a surgery. So uh, sometimes, you know, you would still try to keep it minimally invasive, uh, but you know, you might have to decide uh, which one to choose. And then body physiology is something to consider, especially with lung surgery. Uh, sometimes we end up having to make an opening or, or a bigger opening because when we do lung surgery, uh, we deliberately collapse the side of the lung that we're operating on. And the body, uh, the patient may be someone that cannot tolerate that type of physiology. And so in that case, we might have to, you know, have an open incision to be able to, you know, better control the physiology to, um, to be able to operate. You also focus on robotic surgery. So could you please explain what robotic surgery is used for and discuss some of the pros and cons related to it? Sure, yeah. So um, robotic surgery, interestingly, has has been around for a good while. Um, but it's something that, um, uh, you know, especially in thoracic surgery, just has in the last uh, couple of decades uh, been getting more popular and more so I'd say in the last within the last decade um, but robotic surgery is basically where we um, it's still in the realm of manually invasive because you're using small incisions but we have um, a console uh, uh, which is where the the operating surgeon sits with uh, wristed um, controls and then there is a bedside um uh, robot, which is the bedside unit, which is actually docked on to the patient through uh, through ports that go into the patient's body. And then the instruments go in to this docked uh, assistant and the surgeon's operating on the console. So it's still the surgeon operating. Every movement is by the surgeon. The robot is just the tool or the instrument. Um, and it's... Um, the biggest uh, reason, some of, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, it's it's one of those things where I think the data on, oh, is it better than the, the regular uh, minimally invasive thoracoscopic or laparoscopic surgery? That's, that's still being looked at. Um, I think that's going to be a hard one to prove. But what, what are the, um, the advantages that we do know of? Well, the the robot offers 3D visualization, which is and and enhanced magnification as compared to laparoscopic um, thoracoscopic surgery. So the visualization and the precision that you can get with that is is definitely um, arguably the best. Um, and that means, you know, being able to view something so clearly and precisely means, um, you know, that that you could potentially have better control and uh, better flexibility and better uh, and could do um, a more precise operation. Having said that, I will say that there's nothing, it's not the robot or the visualization is not what makes a surgeon good or bad. Um, a good surgeon can do the same procedure well any of these ways, whether it's with the robot or with the uh, uh, you know, regular scope. Uh, but a good surgeon will also know how to make best use of the advantages that the robot offers. But those and those are the advantages that it offers. 
Um, also, uh, yeah, with regards to outcomes, we talked about, you know, we don't know, but it's definitely something that's been looked at. So does it mean that it, you can perform a better operation or does it mean less impact on the body? I think those are debatable at this point. Um, the cons, um, I would say, well, the biggest biggest thing is that it's um, it's a limited resource. Um, there's definitely a cost to it. It's a very expensive tool. Um, costing over a million so it's it's you know it's something that is not easily available so an or um of say 20 rooms might have um two robots that can be used and of course not not every surgeon would use the robot but it's something that you know the access is difficult you can't just have robots you know robot in every room so it, it it's it's hard to be able to do that um on a more routine basis there's also the cost of things like disposables, you know, the both the environmental value um, or environmental cost and the actual financial cost. That's something to think about. And then technically, it's uh, it's something that uh, most people don't realize, but there is actually because you're not actually holding the instruments directly, there is a loss of tactile feedback that you would have with any of the other method so that haptic feedback that you get is not there with the robot and that's something to get used to and potentially you know for someone that can't understand that or can't get that it could mean um, not such a great surgery or more risk of complications so that's important to understand and it's also you know additional resources in terms of trained bedside assistants so um, I mean some of these things can be worked on and eventually you know, I think as as we move on into the next few years, things will change and become uh, more manageable with that. But currently, these are the issues. Yeah, that, that was very well said. Thank you, Dr. Rao. I think you brought up some really important points in both the, the pros and the cons. So along, along those same lines, um, what are some major advancements that have been made in the field of thoracic surgery in the past five years? So I think... Um, Looking at it from the technical standpoint, I think, of course, like we just said, you know, the minimally invasive approaches have really have really taken off. I think more uh, more surgeons have gone on to uh, um, robotic or minimally invasive surgery in the last few years than um, in the last, say, 30 years. Um, and at this point, I think this at least so uh, about more than 70% of uh, lung cancer surgeries were being done uh, with an open technique uh, in 2008. And then in 2015, uh, about 50% of surgeries were being done with the robot and about 40% with, um, uh, with open technique. So it's, uh, it's something that... Um, uh, sorry, I take that back. Forty percent with the regular vats, and then you know the remaining with the open technique. So, um, so I think in terms of you know minimally invasive approaches, and then you know, and how was that made possible? You know, all the all the instrumentation and all the other technical advances that were made, advances in scanning, three D imaging, being able to better plan a surgery to do. Uh, lesser invasive, better surgery. So uh, all the technical advancement has been has been great in the last uh, few years. <clears throat> and then thinking about it in terms of um, the cancer aspect, I think something to really pay heed to is all the advances that have been made with um, uh, the uh, you know the molecular genetics and the you know, immunotherapies, the advances in targeted therapies. So that's made a huge difference to, uh, you know, who our patients are, you know, pe people that were considered uh, inoperable or, you know, considered, okay, palliative, um, have, have something to hope for. And, you know, we have more treatments to offer. So I think that's a big, um, big thing. The other, other thing that I want to bring up is the um, as the navigational bronchoscopy piece of uh, um, advancement. So just like with the surgeries, there have been, you know, the minimally invasive aspects with the robot, uh, with diagnosis. So, you know, being able to 
biopsy, really deep nodules, difficult to get nodules, being able to prove that this is cancer, something needs to be done, or you know, being able to access those nodules that are found during screening. Um, so there's been a lot of advance with that, advancements with that. Where do you see the future of thoracic surgery going in the next five-ish years? Um, I think um, I think a lot of what has been is going to obviously continue, but the big things are probably going to be, and we're seeing some of this data coming out already. You know, trying to preserve um, lung. So any studies that are looking at and technical, um, you know, methods at at being able to spare more lung if possible. So we're talking about, I don't wanna to get too technical here, but uh, you know, we're talking about rather than taking out like a third of the lung, taking out maybe a fifth of the lung. So rather than doing a lobectomy, doing a segmentectomy, is that going to be adequate? And you know, there's a lot of recent data coming out that you know, that's that's probably just as good, just like, you know, how things have changed in breast cancer surgery. So I see with that just coming out within the last week or so and, you know, other studies in the last year, um, I think a lot of our um, surgeries are going to probably be moving that way in, in the coming years. Also, um, I think there's going to be continued uh, advances in uh, uh, targeted therapies and being able to use that for not just advanced cancers or stage four cancers, but also looking at, you know, using that treatment as an adjunct um, to surgery for earlier stage lung cancers. Because again, we're finding um, patients with uh, in the younger age groups and you know smaller cancers, and so we don't want to go, uh, you know, remove pieces of lung and then you know three years later they show up with cancer again. Uh, so you know, treatments that can, yes, we've cured an early stage lung cancer, but minimize the chances of that coming back again. So that's, I think that those are areas that will definitely grow. And you've done a lot of work um, on disparities in cancer care. So could you tell us more about your work in this area? Sure, yes. Um, so it's one of my interests really, um, it's always been obvious, but you know, as you, as you, move on in this field, it's, uh, uh, it's, it becomes more and more obvious. And there, there comes a point when it gets uh, frustrating that you're seeing this. And, you know, yes, there are a lot of things that are being done, people talking about it, but it just doesn't seem, it never seems enough. Um, and there's always more to be done. Um, and so uh, that's sort of what got me interested in looking at some of the stuff. And there are uh, groups of people um, that I met at, you know, the national and international conferences with similar interests, and um, we started talking about being more involved in, you know, disparities research, and that's how I got involved in this. But a couple of my more recent, um, you know, involved my work with this, um, um, we just looked at um, uh, lung cancer uh, guideline concordant treatment for early stage lung cancer in um, the AIAN population. And it's been, you know, there's uh, quite some research talking about, um, you know, how disparities exist between um, the black and white population or in the, you know, Hispanic population, but there hasn't been too much looking at the AIAN um, population. So we, um, we looked at that and it does seem like, you know, uh, the AIAN population does not get um, guideline concordant care as frequently as do non-Hispanic whites. So that's something that we've uh, recently submitted. Um, other than that, I was recently doing uh, a review uh, for esophageal cancer. I know this is, you know, we're looking at lung cancer here, but still uh, with esophageal cancer as well. Um, although um, non-Hispanic whites are more uh, uh, prone to getting esophageal cancer, survival rates are actually worse in the minorities. Um, and I think um, I think it's time to just, you know, sort of acknowledge that there is, I don't think, you know, we can continue, more, more studies will help us define the problem better, but I think the need of the hour is to actually find uh, a durable and a suitable solution.
Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I know that there have been um, several studies that have published on how um, racial minorities are less likely to get guideline concordant treatment, especially for lung cancer. And so um, according to your research, uh, what are some reasons for why maybe the AI population is not receiving the guideline concordant treatment? Yeah, I think so. Our paper didn't quite cover the reasons why, and uh, uh, and we went we went off of the you know large national uh, database, so it's hard to tease out those. But some of the thoughts that we um, uh, you know that have been put out there by other studies as well is that you know there are always it's always multifactorial, and you know there's patient related factors, there's um, uh, you know, system-related factors, uh, provider-related factors, um, and then, you know, the smoking history. We do know that uh, smoking is is widely prevalent in the AI in population, and, and in certain studies show more than, <clears throat> more than the, uh, uh, you know, other, other minorities. So could that be a reason? Could that be, could it be that, you know, screening is not being adequately utilized? Um, and, you know, so there are, uh, there are several factors that could possibly be, but we didn't uh, delve into that point. Yeah, and along those same lines, uh, the lung cancer screening guidelines were revised in 2021. And so the, the guidelines were expanded to include younger patients and patients with lighter smoking histories. But like you mentioned, um, racial and gender disparities still exist um, because racial minorities and women are less likely, are more likely to be diagnosed with lung cancer at younger ages and have lighter smoking histories and are also more likely to have quit uh, for more than 15 years. So oftentimes um, they don't meet the requirements for lung cancer screening. And so in your opinion, how should the lung cancer screening guidelines be revised to reduce these disparities? And I know um, this is uh, probably the million dollar question in, in the field of lung cancer. So um, I, well, we would just love to hear your thoughts on, on this topic. Yeah, it's um well that's it's not a simple answer because there's so much that goes into it. But I think I saw recently there was um there was a publication, there was a study that said that looked at uh uh that actually minimized it looked like the difference between um the um uh, you know the people eligible for screening before and after the change of guidelines. Um, between uh, the black population and the white population that was actually reduced. The difference was um, minimized after the guidelines changed. So that's promising. <clears throat> Having uh, said that, you know, and yeah, uh, all those facts that you mentioned about women and minorities, that's all true, but also there are other factors. So it's not, it's not just the smoking that um, makes them predisposed to uh, cancer. There are other other risk factors, and I think to answer your question, um, I think there has to be, since we know that it may not, well, smoking is it may be it may have to be looked at differently for different populations, but also maybe focusing on other risk factors. So when there are studies looking at you know lung cancer screening uh, utilization and stuff like that, um, maybe just broadening the perspective to see what other risk factors do these patients have? How did that translate? So maybe that will give us some insight as to, you know, right now we're basing screening purely on the smoking. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe there might be a time when we have to add some other risk factors. Yeah, absolutely. We we just uh, recently did a podcast with um, Dr. Um, Dr. Meda, Hiran Meda, and he does a lot of work with lung cancer risk prediction models. And I think um, what you talked about, um, Dr. Rao, um, is is exactly where um, Dr. Meda was was talking about the field of lung cancer screening going. Is that with the use of lung cancer risk prediction models, we're able to include more variables um, and take into account other risk factors for lung cancer, like exposure to secondhand smoke and radon asbestos, as well as family history of lung cancer, other lung diseases like COPD. So being able to take into account these other risk factors could be very helpful because um, for those who might not be aware, um, lung cancer in every smokers uh, is, uh, occurs in, a, in about one in every five individuals. So it is a, um, it is a very prevalent um, uh, you know, part of, of the lung cancer cases that we have. And so, um, 
it's not just individuals who have a heavy smoking history, but also other individuals who might be at high risk for other risk factors um, should also be getting screened. But right now, it's harder to quantify um, these other risk factors. Unlike quantifying a smoking history, it's, it's more difficult to quantify exposure to secondhand smoke. And so at, at the moment, these other risk factors are not being included in the um, USPSTF screening guidelines, but it's definitely some um, an area where I think a lot of research is being done and, and where we might move um, towards and like and like you mentioned, um, potentially having screening criteria that is tailored and targeted towards different patient populations might be helpful as well. Since, um, since uh, for example, the Asian population is more likely to be diagnosed with lung cancer at younger ages, and so potentially um, having a different um, age threshold for uh, for racial minorities compared to. Um, their white counterparts might be another or another way to go, but there's a lot of research being done um, in this field, as you mentioned. So. In your opinion, how can we best educate all patient populations about lung cancer screening and increase the uptake of screening? Yeah, that's uh, I think that's the eternal question with any screening uh, uh, model, unfortunately. But I think um, you know, I it's important. Awareness is definitely. Uh, key and not just we're not talking about the public here we're talking about amongst providers um, you know and it's not it shouldn't be just the PCP or just the lung cancer doctor or you know I think it's everyone's responsibility to to look out for that and I think there have been I'm sure you know a lot of people are thinking about it and actually uh, you know in the last few months one thing that I've noticed for example is on our epic system there always uh, comes up um, there's a little prompt that comes up if the patient is registered as a smoker, uh, then it'll come up as, um, you know, smoking cessation advice given or, you know. Um, so I haven't seen a specific thing for screening, but it might be, you know, it might be something to consider to have like a prompt like that for every time, every time there's a PCP visit, you know, could there be a prompt? Uh, Probably someone's already working on that, but that's that's one thought. Uh, the other thing, of course, I mean, what what you guys are doing, it's amazing. It's, you know, this is something that talking more about it, I mean, it may seem like, you know, beating a dead horse to some people, but to some others, it may be the first time they're hearing it. So it's, you know, anything that's a, a public message um, should, should be encouraged. Um, and then also... One of the things that we did at the University of Minnesota a few months ago, I think it was in November for you know one case a month, having um, uh, having public events. So you know there was just uh, the, the the clinic, the ground floor of the clinic, just opened up on a Saturday for you know screening, and so uh, incentivizing it for you know whether it's for the, the uh, people, the public, or the provider, um, you know being able to um, you know, make it more interesting or make it, make it something that, you know, people will turn and look at. Um, I think that that's important. Yeah, at our organization, we've talked um, a lot about this topic and um, it, the, the banner, having a banner pop up like within um, patient electronic uh, health records, I think that is a, a wonderful idea because um, sometimes, you know, doctors see so many patients a day and, and it's easy, it can be easy to um, overlook the fact that they might be eligible for lung cancer screening or that ha just having a, a conversation about lung cancer screening would be helpful. So especially if a patient, you know, meets the criteria, has is a um, has heavy smoking history and is within the age range, um, then I think having a banner that says, you know, this patient is eligible for lung cancer screening, you know, it, it, it might be good to have um, this conversation with them. I think that could be very helpful. And also um, including more patient navigators within the health system, I think that can help a lot since um yeah, we've we've had the opportunity to talk with a couple of different patients and, and they've said that um it, they've either had a really um a really easy experience or a difficult experience kind of navigating through um all, how to get screened how to set up the, the the how to set up their exam their test and then also you know getting the results and everything so um having patient navigators kind of walk them through um, all the all the different things that need to happen um, because I, I, with lung cancer there are a couple of other requirements like a shared decision making visit that don't come with you know some of these other cancers so um, uh, a lot of a lot of patients have um, suggested that having more patient navigators could be very helpful but 
That's good to know. And, you know, that's something um, uh, I think we struggle with that in healthcare. You know, people keep just getting taken away because uh, there's no resources or no funding. And, you know, um, if uh, if there can be, um, you know, um, if if people organizations like yours and if uh you know people in power in uh you know the uh parliament can can actually uh support this need and uh allocate more res resources to this it's something that can be done but if you know each hospital is so uh is so depleted at this point that you know there's there's a lot of you know trying to conserve funds and uh i think it's hard to hard to um have extra people just working on one aspect so that's that's that has of course been a big issue yeah absolutely and, and you also mentioned you know opening clinic doors on Saturdays which I think is um a, a, a wonderful idea I think um like in 2023 November 11th is um the national lung screening day um in the U.S. and um on that day a lot of uh you know, clinics are encouraged to open their doors on Saturdays since, um, since, since patients might be working throughout the week and not have the opportunity to take time off of work, which would um, likely mean, you know, um, you know, uh, just deductions to their payroll, which, which, you know, can come with a lot of, uh, with significant impact. And so if we're able to offer a, offer a day or a couple of days um, each month, each year, where um, patients are encouraged to take the, take the time off it and to go get screened and and where it won't affect their work or other other day-to-day -day -day responsibilities that they have I think that can help as well and then um unfortunately with lung cancer and this is something that we've talked about a lot in our podcast is stigma mm -hmm. unfortunately there there is a stigma um associated with lung cancer and and just the the strong association between lung cancer and smoking a lot of individuals um don't realize that a lung cancer can occur in those who don't smoke or those those who don't have heavy smoking histories. Um, but because of this uh, strong association, um, patients, especially those um, patients who might have had a smoking history, um, oftentimes are 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 uh, hesitant to share share the lung cancer diagnosis with others because um, they they feel you know shame or guilt um, that maybe their lifestyle lifestyle choice. Uh, might have resulted in their um, diagnosis, and um, I think that can be very difficult, especially when um, you know you receive a diagnosis like one of lung cancer, which is life life changing and um, you know can be very traumatic in and of itself. Having it come with this baggage of um, and the stigma can make just things a lot more harder. It can make it a lot harder to get help, a lot harder to get screened because um, you know people might be worried about, you know, what, what if I do find something on the scan? And so tackling that stigma, I think is a, is a huge part. And um, it's, it's something that we need to address in a, in a lot of different ways from the public, from, from communities, but also from healthcare professionals, uh, just healthcare providers in general, and also state leaders, national leaders. Um, so I think that is a really big, big challenge for um, the lung cancer community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one other one other thing that we've talked about in the past has been just helping helping individuals get screened, which can come in a, a variety of different ways. But even just helping to support or, or pay for transportation costs or parking fees that might come with getting a scan, having programs in place, um, either you know government programs or or just uh, programs offered within within hospital systems for for patient populations that might need that assistance could um all go a long way yeah and having mobile units uh stuff like absolutely. that so yeah. yeah absolutely so you're very involved with the women in surgery interest group and uh serve as a faculty advisor for the association of women surgeons at the university of minnesota Med medical school and so um while the number of women in surgery and thoracic surgery has increased uh how can we encourage more women to join the profession and how can we overcome these gender disparities that may exist in representation within the profession, leadership roles, and salary? Yeah. So this is, I mean, the like disparities with a lot of other things. I think it's important to acknowledge that there is, um, you know, there is uh, 
there are disparities. Um, and I definitely don't want to sugarcoat it, um, you know, but I think it's something that um, uh, it's, it's, there's definitely been a change compared to, you know, the situation, like say 25 years ago to now. Uh, what you hear from people that, you know, women thoracic surgeons that were, you know, just starting the career or like mid career 25 years ago to where we are now is a, is a big change. And so like every other change, it takes time. Um, so I've had the, you know, I've definitely had the, uh, you know, privilege of uh, being involved with women, um, surgical student, uh, women students interested in surgery and also with the women residents. And I also am quite active with the women in thoracic surgery of the international group there. So um, I think this has all exposed me to a, a, a lot of good and bad things. Um, so I would say, you know, uh, I think it's important to realize that, you know, you can't expect someone else to make a change. You have to make the change. You have to be the change. Um, and so more, more women um, and, you know, other genders that can be in in this put put a you know put their put their face forward put their work forward um and be able to you know speak up for themselves and for others that they're mentoring or sponsoring i think that's that's where uh that's where you can help yourself and help others it's not something where you can say uh, you, where you can be the victim and expect you know help from uh others without you know you doing it for yourself so I think it's, uh, and there are a lot of people who are willing to support. And I think it's just important to be able to recognize and make best use of that. And it's, you know, the more, the only way we're going to be able to do that is more women coming in. It's it's going, so when there's one woman surgeon, you know, you know in a group of hundred, you're going to be looked at differently. The rules are not going to be in your favor. The way things work are not going to be in your favor. Uh, because whoever thought that they would have to incorporate maternity leave in ACGME program, but if there are if fifty percent of residents are women, you better do that because that's you know that is needed. So the more women there can be and more women are represented, then we can change what uh, what you know what is suitable for us, and it it becomes the norm. So I think that's um, um, that's what you know, and knowing that there are people that are. Um, rooting for you and helping you. The other, uh, just on that note, the other thing that, you know, just, uh, I also have been trying to do some work on an international level with, uh, you know, collaborating with uh, Europe and Africa and Asia through the WTS and um, the European societies to um, expand this um uh, this sort of collaboration and interaction and encourage growth and development, not just here in the US, but also across the world, because it's a global issue, not just not just here. We will now be moving into our public Q&A session with uh, questions from our live audience. So if you guys have any questions to ask Dr. Rao, please either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. So we've received a couple of questions already, and so I'll start off. I'll start off with asking a first um, Q and A session, Q and A question. Um, the question asks, "What are some promising projects in research in the lung cancer field that you've heard of that interest you?" Um, so I think, um, uh, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, technical uh, aspects of uh, lung cancer management. Um, like we were talking about, you know, doing lesser resections, you know, our, our segmentectomies or lesser parenchymal sparing uh, operations, are they, are they adequate? I know two big studies have come out, but I, I think there's going to be more research looking into that. And so that's something that I want to keep my eyes open for. The other thing is um, uh, small cell cancer. So usually when we talk about lung cancer, we're talking about non-small cell lung cancer, which is, you know, which is what uh, a lot of these screening programs and studies and everything's based on. But the small cell lung cancer, which was once thought to be totally non-surgical uh, and a 
you know, medical radiation oncology type of uh, management. Um, the paradigm's changing now, and there are, you know, uh, people with small cell lung cancer that can be, uh, that we can get better, better outcomes with surgical management. So, uh, and that's expanding into what it can potentially include. So I'm, uh, I think that's something that I'm interested in as well. And other than that, I think esophageal cancer is, it's one of those, deadly cancers, very aggressive cancers, um, as well as mesothelioma. So new treatments coming out with uh, those two, which are also my specific interests is, is what I'm interested in. So I received another question that says, what was what has been the most memorable patient case for you? Oh, I don't know that I can pick one. <laughs> it's... Um, I think it's, um, there have been a lot, to be honest. And I think, you know, it's, um, there are there are a few that, you know, really touch your heart on a personal level. Uh, there are some others where, you know, it, it gives you, it just gives you that uh, fulfillment of having done a procedure right uh, that, you know, translated into a good outcome. Um, so there have been a few like that. Um, of course, it's, you know, um, I guess um, it's always nice when you hear from or see a patient that you operated on years ago and they're still doing great. So one of the ones that I always think about is uh, there's still this one patient that I operated on for mesothelioma, which, you know, it's a pretty poor prognosis overall, but there are some that do really well. It, he's five years out and still sends me a Christmas card every year. And, you know, it's nice to know that he's out there and doing well. Uh, similarly, there have been uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, you do your best and you get so involved and you you want them to do well, but something just doesn't go right. And, um, you know, patients uh, pass and it's, it's, it's hard. And so those... Those are the not so great memorable ones, but they're still memorable and that, you know, you learn something from that and you go through that emotion and that helps you grow and learn. So we have another question. Um, what is the best way to dismantle stigma around lung cancer among providers? Um, so just to clarify is that, are we talking about the smoking, the stigma around smoking and lung cancer that? Yes. We, yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I think you summarized it uh, pretty well when you talked about it, actually. But um, I think uh, it's important for us to not, um, not attach a personal sort of bias uh, to that when we see a patient. Um, and I mean, I can tell you, I've always I've always hated the smell of smoke and I you know I hate the thought of smoking and the thought of secondhand smoke um however you know when I and and I could go in with that with that mindset but when I talk to patients a lot of times you hear their stories you know they they say oh I've been trying so hard I really want to quit but I can't you know or they say well I grew up in the 70s I mean we didn't even know that it was harmful everyone did it and I did it and now it's hard to get off of it and so it's it's you know people come in with different stories it's not like they you know uh, very rarely do you see someone that's just like I just don't want to try it that's rare and that they may still have a reason but I think it's important from uh, our end as providers to know that we should not bring in our personal bias onto a patient that we are meeting you know just for a fraction of their lifetime so we don't know enough about them to to uh, you know pass a judgment or form an opinion. Uh, we are there as a provider to you know to uh, to be able to offer the best care. Um, and yes, I mean if that means having to, I I scare my patients when I tell them that they're smoking when you know I tell them they're going to have lung surgery. Um, I tell them how bad it's going to be if they continue smoking and you know how the risks are increased and all that stuff. But um, but it should not be on a judgmental or a personal level. And it's hard to do sometimes, but it's we need to be conscious of that. That was very well said. 
Um, and then our last question um, is, what are important questions that lung cancer patients should ask their doctor when either determining their treatment plan or, um, or uh, I think this, is, this question is mainly focusing on treatment plan, but what are, what are some important questions that patients should ask their doctors? Right, that's a great question. Um, so I think it's, uh, whenever you think of cancer, it's important to know what is the extent of the cancer and what are the treatment options? Because a lot of times, um, you know, we see patients that have had, you know, usually you want to get, say, a CAT scan, a PET scan, a brain scan, make sure, you know, you adequately state the patient so you're offering the right treatment. Uh, you know, sometimes these, these studies may be missed. And so making sure that, you know, the uh, have we done all the tests? You know, have we figured out where we are exactly uh, and what is going to help? So making sure that the groundwork, the homework is done adequately is, is a good first step. In terms of the actual treatment plan, uh, especially in the current um, you know, environment, like we just talked about, a lot of targeted therapies, new therapies, new treatments, there is so much going on that you you would you um, would be at a disadvantage if you're not being um, say discussed at a, a multidisciplinary group or if you know if an oncologist is not evaluating um, the patient to see what what additional treatments can be given because again a lot of times you know someone may just get referred to a surgeon oh here's the cancer we'll take it out and that's that um, but having a um, having a multidisciplinary approach, knowing, oh, is this is this cancer a type that, you know, one of these other new treatments might help? Or is there a, a trial that can I that I can be a part of that might that might be helpful for minimizing the chances of cancer coming back? So I think uh, knowing if uh, if the patient is a right candidate for any of the newer newer treatments. And then also knowing what the options for minimally invasive versus, um, you know, the traditional open. And like we said earlier, it's not just about, you know, the cosmetics of a smaller incision. It's been proven enough times that, you know, patients recover better, maybe are able to get to other treatments quicker, you know, heal better, the impact on the body is less. So with all that, knowing if someone's offering an open surgery, you want to know why not minimally invasive? Um, what what would make this, you know, be ruled in or ruled out for them? So we're going to go ahead and conclude the podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao, for your willingness to share your wealth of knowledge and perspective on many of the issues of the lung cancer world. We truly appreciate all the work and research that you are doing. And thank you, everyone, for listening to our podcast. Please keep an eye out for our upcoming podcasts and events, which will be listed on our website, www.lc.org. Over the next few weeks, we will have podcasts with Dr. Estelamari Rodriguez, Dr. Moshine, and Dr. Emily Stone. Zoom registration and information on these individuals can be found on our website under calendar events or our Instagram bio. Thank you, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.